Well, thank you for joining us once again. Welcome to Grace. Uh, we begin our study today with the children of Israel encamped at Abel Shatim. And I think uh, everybody pretty much knows where that is. We'll look at our, we'll look at our map, the uh, Israel's 40-year journey map, once again, to get our bearings. But from Abel Shatim, Israel's going to make their way down to the River Jordan. Uh, and at long last, they'll be able to uh, cross into the land of Canaan, the land that God promised for their forefather Abram. In the book of Deuteronomy, we find a great review by Moses as to Israel's wilderness wanderings and how they ended up at Abel Shatim in the first place. Uh, even though Deuteronomy has to do with the second giving of the law, which is what that word means, it also contains an overview of Israel's journey to Abel Shatim and the conflicts they faced along that journey. So from Kadesh Barnea all the way to Abel Shatim is the book of Numbers. Uh, we, we went through that and took several weeks to do so. Uh, then we get to the book of um, Joshua and we find uh, they're leaving Abel Shatim, going down to the Jordan. But we go back to the book of Deuteronomy again, written just before they crossed over that river from Abel Shatim, where they were given the law one more time. Uh, now let's look at Deuteronomy 2.14, uh, where we see uh, a review here, and the space, written here, and the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we were come to the brook Zered was 30 and 8 years. So that's 38 of their 40 years of wandering, 38 spent there at Kadesh Barnea in that area, until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host, as the Lord swear unto them. You recall that the generation God delivered from Egyptian captivity was not permitted to enter the land because of unbelief. Uh, they demonstrated greater, greater faith in the ten spies who returned with that negative report uh, that Israel should not even attempt to enter Canaan uh, than they had shown in the Most High God who told them earlier that uh, he would drive out their enemies before them and that the land belonged to them. Uh, so that unbelieving generation, the first generation of, the, of those who had been held captive in Israel, uh, that generation was sentenced to die in the wilderness rather than to take possession of the land that had been right at their doorstep. Uh, we then came to the second generation of Israel as they were encamped at Abel Shatim. Uh, Israel's doorway to the Jordan, where Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy giving a detailed account of Israel's journey and her victories up to that point in time. Uh, he recalled that on their way to Abel Shatim, God had given direction that the Israelites were not to distress the Edomites. Do you see the Edomites there on the map? Uh, and the Edomites would be about a uh, th third of the way down, uh, almost halfway down on the right side where, where you see Petra, uh, the Edomite uh, fortification. But they were not to distress the Edomites. Um, you can see there, uh, take a good look at Edom there on the map, and you'll see where it was located, to the right of Kadesh Barnea, uh, the area where Israel had spent numerous years, and from where the 12 spies were sent out to uh, check out that land. Israel was also forbidden to cause any harm to the Moabites. You can see the Moabites up above Edom there. Or the Ammonites, as uh, the Moabites and Ammonites were descendants of Lot through that incestuous uh, plot that was hatched by his daughters. And God had already given the land to, the, to Moab and Ammon. He'd already given that territory to, to, to Lot. So the Edomite territory he had given to Edom. And remember who Edom was. Edom was also Esau was called Edom. So Esau was given the territory where he was. That's Petra and Edom. The Moabites and Ammonites... Um, ancestors of Lot were given the territories where they were dwelling. So um, even though those territories were given over and, and Israel was not to bother those uh, peoples, uh, they were permitted to uh, go in and have victory over the Amorites. And the Amorites dwelt between the Moabites and Ammonites. Now, there's a lot of ites to keep track of, but if you keep looking at the map, you'll see what we're talking about. Follow the arrows there as the arrows go up around Edom around Moab to the territory of the Amorites and not, not, uh, not taking into account the Ammonites because they didn't bother the Ammonites either. Um, and so it was in this territory, uh, actually there and above Ammon, uh, that Israel would encounter two kings, King Sihon and King Og. 
Anyone heard of King Sion and King Og? Well, they were special in a particular way. Uh, we didn't fully expand on that in our previous session, so we'll go into it more today. This is where we'll move to a new map I've entitled Conquest of the Kings. Uh, the account of Israel's battle against these two kings, Sihon and Og, and their armies demonstrates the mighty way that God uh, exercised his compound Jehovah name on behalf of his people. Now, by the way, Israel's defeat of these two kings, Sion and Og, was the reason why Balak sent Balaam to curse Israel, or called for Balaam to curse Israel, which uh, we took note of in an earlier study. Heshbon, a major city of the Amorites, and I don't know if we have that there. We do. Okay, Heshbon, a major city, uh, sat eastward of Abel Shatim and under King Sihon's rulership. Uh, so to the north of Sihon's territory was the kingdom of Og. He was up further north, and Og was King Sihon's brother. Now, King Og's territory was known as Bashan. You can see that up there. I think I've got that. Uh, if we don't have that listed up there, it'll be listed on another one. Uh, and that was the territory of Bashan. Edrei, I think you can see Edrei up there, uh, was a major city in the territory of Bashan. And um, it would be very important for Israel to conquer these two kings, Sihon and Og, and eliminate all who were associated with these two kings because all this territory was actually located in Eden, the land that was originally promised to Abram. Now, Og and, and uh, Sihon were giants in the land. So this was something uh, Israel would be up against uh, some, some odds here, so to speak, when they encountered these giants. As noted earlier, Israel was to make no league to have no associate, associations with these oppositionites, that was our name for them, uh, because God knew that those people groups who were opposed to him uh, would lead his people to worship their false gods. Another major consideration was the fact that the giants and their offspring inhabited these territories. Giants were living on both sides of the River Jordan. And I think you can see that Rephium on the right and Anakim on the left. Uh, they were given various names. We'll talk a bit about that. The giants were given those different names by the different uh, people groups, such as uh, one name was Emim, another name was Zamzuman. Uh, Rapha or Rephium, as you can see there on the map, and Anakim. But all the giants, uh, scholars tell us, were related to the Nephilim uh, that we read about in Genesis chapter 4. So let's look back at that verse to see what Israel was actually up against as they were going through these territories. Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare, bare children unto them. Be, uh, the same, those children became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now we're going to run across that later when we come to these kings. Uh, so rather than make association with the giants, or the people of the territories who had mixed with those giants, the Israelites were to utterly destroy them. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 2, Moses was recounting how the Israelites fought those giants and fought the peoples in those areas. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 2 for a moment and read that account beginning with verse 32. Then Sion, a giant and a king of that territory, came out against us, he and all his people, to fight at Jahaz. And the Lord our God delivered him before us, and we smote him and his sons and all his people. And we took all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed, notice it here, the men and the women and the little ones of every city. We left none to remain. Why would they slaughter the men, the women, and the little ones of that area? Well, this is proof positive, folks, that God has always had a foreknowledge of faith. Uh, just as he knew very well before Jacob and Esau ever drew breath how those two and their descendants would respond to him, God knew equally well how the people Israel would encounter on their journey to the Jordan uh, would adversely affect his nation, given sufficient time and the opportunity to do so. In fact, the people of King Sihon had come out to fight against Israel in order to prevent their passage toward Jordan. So... Not only that, but remember these people groups were mixed with the giants. And those giants, we didn't call them man, we didn't call them angel. At one period of time in past studies, we called them mangel. Uh, so they were the offspring of the daughters of, or the sons of God coming in unto the daughters of men. Don't think for a moment, though, that God was indiscriminately bringing about the slaughter of innocent human beings. 
uh, God knew full well the hearts of the people who were opposing him and his people as they made their way to the Jordan River. Uh, had there been one, one individual that God knew would eventually turn to him, even one, I'm sure we'd be reading that about God's providential uh, protection over that person. But in fact, we're going to be seeing his protective care uh, for a harlot uh, coming up. That harlot, who knows her name? Rahab, sure, Rahab. We're going to read about that a little later in this lesson. Israel was to utterly destroy all who God foreknew would remain in opposition to him and to his nation, which is precisely what Israel did when it came to King Sion and his people, men, women, and children, as we read earlier. The only lives the Israelites spared were the lives of the animals mentioned in verse 35. Only the cattle we took for a prey, some, some uh, bounty there, for a prey unto ourselves and the spoil of the cities we took from Aroer, a stream east of the Jordan, which is by the brink, that's short, literally shoreline of the river of Arnon, and from the city that is by the river, even unto Gilead, there was not one city too strong for us. The Lord our God delivered all unto us. So here, Moses is giving credit to the Lord for delivering the nation Israel. Uh, we don't see the people giving the Lord that credit, but we see Moses giving the Lord that credit. Here it appears that Israel was doing precisely as God had directed, and Moses certainly understood that it was God who was delivering the nation. The Israelites killed everything that drew breath, uh, save for, again, the livestock in Sihon's kingdom. The same was true when it came to uh, King Og, who happened to be, be King Sion's brother. King Og ruled over the territory north of his brother's kingdom, as we have shown on the map. King Og was a Rephaim, a giant. Listen to Moses recount the story of Israel's defeat of King Og in Deuteronomy chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Then we turned and went up to the way of Bashan, that was in that northern area there, north of, of the Ammonites. And Og, the king of Bashan, a name for that region, came out against us. He and all his people to battle at Adre, uh, Adrei, <laughs> looks like Edrei, but Adre, uh, Adrei, and the Lord said unto me, fear him not, for I will deliver him, and all his people, and his land, into thy hands, and thou shalt do unto him, as thou did, didst unto Sion, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. In other words, God was telling Israel, Israel destroy everything that draws breath. Uh, save for the livestock, which you can take as a prey or plunder. But, uh, by the way, this is the same story sitting here in Deuteronomy that's, that we'll see in Numbers chapter 21. Uh, Moses is simply recapping here in Deuteronomy chapter 3 with the giving of that, re-giving of that law, the events is recorded in Numbers chapter 21. Uh, did Israel obey the Lord when it came to bringing the same fate to the inhabitants of the kingdom of Og as Israel had brought on, uh, brought to those of his brother Sihon. Well, apparently so, as seen in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 3. So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, another giant down, uh, the king of, the region of, Bashan, and all his people. And we smote him until how many? None was left to him remaining. So Israel's doing precisely as Israel was told to do. Uh, all living beings, save for the livestock, were destroyed at the hands of the Israelites. God, once again, exercising his Jehovah Nissi name on behalf of his nation. Uh, what a mighty conquest God was giving the nation Israel prior to their crossing the River Jordan and making their entrance into their promised land, Canaan. Notice verses 4 and 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 3. And we took all Og's cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Three score cities. How many, how many uh, cities would that have been? Sixty cities that Israel destroyed to the right of the Jordan River, to the east of the Jordan River, otherwise known as Transjordan. Uh, all the region of Argob, the kingdom of Og in Bashan, all these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars, beside unwalled towns a great many. So these cities were highly fortified, and yet Israel was over to overcome those 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 places. So God gave Israel the victory over 60 highly fortified cities and a great many unwalled communities to boot. Uh, listen to Moses tell about Israel's conquests in verses 6 and 7 in Transjordan, or east of the Jordan River. And we utterly destroyed them, the inhabitants of all those places, as we did unto Sihon, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying, here it is again, the men, women, and children of every city. 
but all the cattle and the spoil of the cities we took for our prey to ourselves. Uh, it's difficult to imagine as we read these stories and just float across them with our eyes, all the bloodshed and the enormous uh, loss of life. Um, I'll be at the life including the offspring of the result of that which was described to us in Genesis chapter 6, 4, where the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and bare children to them. So these children were a mixture too um, uh, of an unholy creation or, or um, you know, generation from those giants. God took care of those rebellious members of the angelic host as seen in Jude 6 where we read, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Those angels won't get away with what they did, uh, which leads many Bible scholars to believe that the angels mentioned in Jude 6 were guilty of an unholy union with the daughters of men, in, in, and that's Jude 7, uh, where we read, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, even in the same way that Sodom and Gomorrah in the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after, next two words, strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, the territories Israel conquered prior to crossing the Jordan River, namely the kingdoms of Sion and Og, are closely related to Sodom and Gomorrah, in that present-day archaeologists are identifying Abel Shatim, where Israel was encamped, as being the actual site of biblical Sodom, uh, where the Bible talks about the sons of God going after strange flesh. You can see why giants were in the land in that area. In fact, let me read to you an email sent from some friends of our ministry who have been a part of those archaeological digs. Um, this is what they wrote to me not too long ago. Listening to your teaching on Exodus, we thought you might be interested in a little side note we told you about the archaeological dig we're doing in Tal El Hammam, Biblical Sodom. That site is also recognized as Abel Shatim, or Shatim. Look on your Bible, Mac, that they tell me, as mentioned in Numbers 25.1, Joshua 2.1, 3.1, and 3.18. The Israelites camped here before crossing the Jordan, right on the site of Sodom where God's judgment had unmistakably occurred. They concluded their email by saying, we obviously find this area fascinating and thought you would too. Uh, I certainly do find it fascinating. Uh, and interesting that they were listening to our messages and following along as they're actually conducting a dig there at Abel Shatim. In connection with the angels who left their first estate, the book of Jude went on to say, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. And that's what we're reading about, these territories here, that Israel's going in and conquering Og and Sion and all these uh, giants, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh. Um, should we be surprised then to find Israel encamped at Abel Shatim, uh, Sodom, having to conquer giants in the cities that were around them? Uh, of course, they were, they were there. The giants had settled on both sides of the Jordan. But Sodom is specifically mentioned in connection with the inhabitants giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. Uh, the word strange in Jude 7 is the Greek heteros, meaning flesh of a different kind. Uh, a dictionary of the Greek includes the word altered in its definition of heteros. That's interesting in itself, uh, in that the angels who appeared to men did so in fleshly form, uh, but not, not uh, the flesh of men, but they appeared as the, having the flesh of men. So keep in mind, as we look at Israel's conquests, God had not only given Israel the land of Canaan, he had given them the ter entirety of the territory described in the Bible as Eden, and that took in both sides of the Jordan River. Uh, Eden includes all the land from the Nile River in Egypt all the way to the Euphrates River that forms its eastern border. So the children of Israel were actually in the territory of Eden as they were encamped at Abel Shatim, conducting the conquests in the surrounding areas uh, of which we've been reading where those giants were residing. Canaan was simply an area within Eden, the area within Eden in which God planned for the Israelites to reside. Uh, that territory will be divided up later on. But again, giants were residing on both sides of the Jordan. Israel was enabled to utterly destroy all who were standing between them and their entrance into Canaan. And at the same time, God was using Israel to destroy the giants who had been a part of Satan's plan to retain his own possession of that land. And you see, God was in the initial phase of reclaiming 
what had always belonged to him. And that was the territory of his previous throne room, the territory of Eden. And by way of that reclamation, God would repossess the entire earthly realm. After all, the earth belongs to the Most High God, uh, creator of the heavens and the earth, the Bible tells us. So what a mighty display of God's name uh, the Most High God was setting forth on, uh, to the nation that he would use in his earthly repossession plan. Israel would have no excuse when it came to crossing Jordan, entering Canaan, and devoting their worship to the Most High God who had brought that nation into existence in the first place and had given them the victory over, given them the victory over these opposition ice. They shouldn't have had the slightest misgiving when it came to the capacity resident in God's name. Nor should they have had the slightest mis misconception about the lack of their own capacity apart from the Most High God exercising his name on their behalf. As a quick side note here, notice what Moses had to say about Og, the king over the territory of Bashan, the king that Israel, Israel defeated and all his people. And Moses makes a statement in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11. This gives us a little more insight into what the children of Israel were up against as they faced these giants in that territory. Deuteronomy 3, 11. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. The giants east of the Jordan, that is. And behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Uh, nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. So that tells us, when we do some uh, transferring here, that Og's bed would have been about 13 and a half feet long by six feet wide. Uh, this is bigger than a California king. <laughs> this is a pretty big bed as illustrated in the artist's rendition that uh, you see on the overhead there. This was no ordinary bed because Og was no ordinary man. It was a bed fit for a giant. It was a, bed, it, it was a bedstead of iron, according to Moses. Uh, this would suggest, at least to me, that it was built to withstand more weight than an ordinary bed would be built to, to maintain, especially since Moses mentions the iron structure uh, of that bed in nearly the same breath as he mentions its size. Uh, but King Og was not the only giant with which the Israelites would have to contend. The sons of Anak, the giants referred to as the Anakim, are said to have been occupying Hebron inside the land of Canaan, according to the book of Numbers. And this is where Israel's headed. So you can see Hebron there to the lower left. Yeah, it's all the way to the lower left around all those little stars. It represents slaughters uh, that Israel conducted. But Hebron's in the, to the lower left on our conquest of the king's map. These maps are on our website under the resource tab. Israel would not only have to contend with giants to the east side of Jordan, they'd have to battle against giants after crossing the Jordan. It's obvious that Satan was intent on keeping Israel out of the land that God had given them. And the giants who were occupying that land were simply just another of Satan's battle strategies against the Most High God. Looking northward from Hebron, on the left of the map, we find the city of Gath toward the top. You see that? I see some heads nodding. You see the city of Gath, often referred to as Gath of the Philistines. Now what does that tell you? Um, there have been numerous archaeological digs in Gath, by the way. First Chronicles chapter 20 talks about a huge man who abode, who abode rather in that city. Uh, this man was apparently a giant. Notice verses 6 and 7 as we jump ahead for a, for a brief time to First Chronicles. First Chronicles 20 verse 6. And yet again there was war at Gath where was a man of great stature. Uh, now these men, these giants, as we learned earlier, were men of renown and the offspring of the giants. Look at this, this figure though, this man of great stature whose fingers and toes were four and twenty, six on each hand, six on each foot. And he also was the son of the giant. Now that's definite articles present, the son of what giant? Uh, most have heard of biblical Goliath, uh, the Philistine giant, uh, that David encountered later in Israel's history? Well, Gath was the home city of Goliath and his brothers. So again, there were giants on both sides of the Jordan River prior to Israel arriving at Abel Shatim. They were firmly entrenched in that area. And Satan knew it, and so did God. Uh, the ten spies had earlier stated that the Israelites were grasshopper in comparison to the residents in Canaan. Uh, an obvious exaggeration. They were grasshoppers, but not trusting God... Uh, 
those spies, there's 10 of them at least, were afraid to enter the land. They didn't want Israel to, to even to, to make an attempt to enter the land. But you can easily see what Israel was up against once again and what they had to contend with if they were to occupy the land that God had given them. Giants were dwelling throughout that territory. Since God had given Israel the victory over giants before they crossed the Jordan, Israel was being clearly shown by the Most High God that they could fully rely upon him to deliver them after they had come into the land of Canaan. Let's move from the book of Deuteronomy to the book of Joshua. And we'll, we'll spend most of our time in Joshua now today for the remaining of this study, and then we'll be ready to move into Judges next week. But um, we're going to go back to the book of Joshua, as the Lord told Joshua to prepare the nation to make their crossing of the river Jordan. Here it is in Joshua chapter 1, right at the outset. Now, after the death of Moses... The servant of the Lord, it came, uh, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, his sidekick assistant, we might say, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, Joshua, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Now, watch God describe to Joshua the territory that belonged to Israel in verses 3 and 4. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. Would Israel have any problem occupying the territory God had given them? Well, the Lord gives Joshua the answer to that question in verses 5 and 6. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. What a promise to, to Joshua, um, warrior Joshua. Uh, As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Magnificent promise here. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Joshua would lead, Joshua would lead Israel, Israel to victory in every conflict they faced. Uh, be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I, I swear unto their fathers to give them. So God had made a promise to Abram. And God intended to keep his promise, as simple as that. This is the I am that I am component of God's name that he wanted Israel to learn. God is the ever faithful one, the ever present, ever faithful one, the self-existent one. And God would faithfully exercise his name on behalf of his nation. God keeps his promises. Um, they, Israel could count on this. Three times God told Joshua to be strong and courageous. The third time, sitting in verse 9, where the Lord stated, Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. The tendency would have been to be just those things, especially facing those, uh, those giants and their, their size. Uh, For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Uh, one of God's compound Jehovah names is Jehovah Shammah. Uh, we noted this earlier. It is on our chart there, meaning the Lord is present. Uh, he said, God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. The Lord is here. The Lord will be there. The Lord is with you wherever you go. And this is something that, that the Most High God wanted Israel to learn about his name, given they'll have the responsibility in time future to make his name great among the nations of the earth when this millennial kingdom is set up. God was promising Joshua, or when the millennial kingdom is set up, God was promising Joshua, Joshua that he would exercise that component of his name on behalf of the nation as Joshua led them into the land that had been given to, to, to the Israelites. Israel wouldn't have to wonder uh, whether God would be with them when it came to inheriting the land that God gave them. They should know that he would be. God knew that Israel would have to come against the people who were doing Satan's bidding, including all those giants we took note of, who were already firmly entrenched in that land. Satan had his players in place, in a manner of speaking, before Abram ever went to that land. And Satan wasn't about to give up the land without a fight. So a fight God would give him. Uh, a fight that God would, would actually win. Uh, God wanted Israel to learn his name. And he wanted them to learn that they could depend upon his name. As Israel was making preparations to enter Canaan, Joshua sent two spies to scope out the land before they made their river crossing. And this is where the harlot Rahab enters the picture. Now, why would he send two spies? 
Has anyone questioned that or did you ever wonder? How many spies did Moses send out? Anyone remember? One, uh, a representative from each tribe. How many tribes? Twelve tribes. So how many spies did Moses send out? Twelve spies. <laughs> how many came back with a negative report? Don't go into that land. There were grasshoppers in their sight. Ten of those spies. Only two came back, Caleb and Joshua. Only two came back with a positive report. A report, rather. Ten of those spies came back with a lack of faith. We'll never be able to do it report. Um, and two of the men, Joshua and Caleb, as I said, came back with a staunch in faith, let's get it done, uh, report. It's interesting that this time around, Joshua only sends two spies. Uh, I, I find that interesting. It's the opinion, my opinion at least, that sending only two spies suggests that Joshua wasn't looking for a can we do it land scan uh, when he sent those two spies. Joshua was looking for a how should we go about it, how can we get it done type of report. Joshua fully expecting that God would get it done for the nation. Uh, the two spies Joshua sent to search out the land came to the house of a lady named Rahab. And some of you are familiar with that story. Most of the young people who've had Sunday school days uh, remember Rahab. Who was Rahab? Uh, some folks might ask. Well, Rahab was a Canaanite. Uh, Rahab was a Gentile. And Rahab was a prostitute living in Jericho. Uh, and that's where Israel's going to be heading after they cross the Jordan. Some have questioned why these two men of Israel, fully entrusted by Joshua to, to go check out that land, entrusted by Joshua to do the right thing, why these two guys would go into the house of a harlot in the first place. Uh, did they know where they were going? What were those two men thinking? Now, don't allow your imaginations to turn immediately toward the negative. Uh, they may not have known, not being from that area, that Rahab was a prostitute. But let's assume they did know that she was a prostitute. And running an inn, by the way. Even if they had known those details, think about it. These men were spies. Uh, what better place to remain incognito than in a house known to be frequented often and by various men? Uh, if you don't think that God's plan include, included the use of Rahab before these spies from Joshua snuck into the land, uh, you should understand that this prostitute from Jericho is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? If, if you follow the line to Jesus Christ from Abraham through Isaac, Jacob, Judah, on down through David, you'll find Rahab to have played a part in Christ's lineage. While you look at the Abraham to Christ lineage chart, follow the names as I read the family tree uh, as it's listed, uh, provided to us in the book of Ruth, chapter 4, beginning with verse 18. I'll read the verse. It won't appear on the overhead, but follow the names. Ruth 4, 18. Now these are the generations of Pharez. Pharez begat Hezron. Hezron begat Ram. And Ram begat Aminadab. Dab. And Aminadab begat Nashon. And Nashon begat Salmon. And Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. Now these are all the men, and that's as it should be, but who came from the line of David? The answer is Jesus Christ. So, yes, Gentile women married Israelite men, and they were included in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Rahab being the first of four. Because as you can see there, Rahab was the wife of Salmon. Uh, so Rahab was the first of four Gentile ladies who would be married to Israelite men. If you really think about it, was Abraham not a man from the nations, plural, when God used him to become the forefather of a nation, of a particular nation, Israel? Uh, so God formed a nation out of the nations, meaning Gentiles. The word Gentiles, the word nations, are the same word in the Hebrew language. Uh, the word goi. Uh, to be sure, Jesus Christ, the God-man, represented the entire human race when he became sin for the entirety of humanity on the cross of Calvary. So God used Rahab in the lineage of his son for a reason. Uh, God knew something about Rahab as well, long before the spies entered her house, having looked for a place to remain uh, unaware to the people around them, a place where they wouldn't be particularly noticeable, they wouldn't stand out uh, to the people in that vicinity. They were looking for a place where the people would expect to see men different men coming in and going out that they didn't readily recognize. Uh, a prostitute's house provided perfect cover uh, for the spies as they went on to conduct their mission. Little did those two spies know at that time 
uh, that the Holy Spirit had in, been involved in their covert plan the entire time. Uh, let's briefly follow the story as it appears in Joshua chapter 2, beginning with verse 2. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. Someone had ratted them out, who were not told. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come unto thee, uh, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. Definitely somebody had spotted them and was uh, uh, alerting the king here of Jericho. Had this all been a part of God's plan to begin with? God knowing ahead of time what would transpire concerning Rahab and her relatives, should the king get word the spies were actually there in her home? Well, the answer is yes. God had a plan to protect Rahab because God knew some things about Rahab. The story continues with Rahab hiding the spies on a rooftop. Um, she hid them in stalks of flax that she'd gathered and placed on a roof for later use. The Canaanites would wet the flax and then dry it on their rooftops to be used in the production of linen uh, primarily, but other things as well. Flax was an extremely important crop in that day. The Israelites used uh, dyed linen in the construction of the curtains, if you recall, uh, in the tabernacle. The priesthood's garments were made of lemon, uh, or lemon, of linen, maybe lemon scented linen, who knows. Rich folks used linen. Uh, Solomon used linen in his bedding, as seen in 1 Kings chapter 10. So linen was a, was a major um, item. Linen pictured purity. In the days of Moses and Joshua, it's often depicted in Scripture. You may have heard the Bible expression, clothed in fine linen. Of course, angels are described as appearing in fine linen. The Bible talks about saints being clothed in fine linen. If the priests had unremovable stains on their linen garments, or should their linen garments become torn in any way, those garments were to be ripped into strips and recycled as candle wicks. Uh, just an interesting side note, preparing linen for use in curtains, uh, for use in clothing, for use in bedding, for use in burial coverings, who knows how many other uses, was a thriving business in Joshua's day. Gathering flax and preparing it for use by the producers of those products would have been a way to add to a person's income at that time. Rahab was doing that very thing. Uh, little would the authorities think anything to be amiss, uh, anything untoward going on when Rahab had stalks of linen piled high on her rooftop for the drying process. That's where the linen was dried. Uh, interestingly enough, Proverbs 31 verse 13 describes the virtuous woman of that day as one who seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. I'm sure some of you remember that. Uh, don't, uh, this is not to tell the ladies of today they're to run out and seek wool and flax, but that's what they did in that day. Well, Rahab was a woman who gathered flax, but Rahab was far from being a virtuous woman. Um, she was cunning. She was a cunning woman. Uh, but if you had known Rahab in those days, virtuous would probably be the last word that would come to your mind when used to describe Rahab. Uh, the story goes on in Joshua to tell how the king sent to Rahab's house for the surrender of the men who she had been lodging and, uh, and hiding out. Uh, the spies couldn't be found because Rahab had secreted them away under all that flax that she had accumulated on her rooftop. Might she have been given that flax in return for the favors of her profession? Uh, we don't know, but that's just something interesting to ponder. Uh, we're not told how she acquired the flax, only that she had a sufficient quantity of it to, to provide a suitable hiding place for the two spies sent, by, or sent from Joshua. When the authorities arrived, Rahab told them that the men had indeed been there. She didn't lie about that. They had been there, but that they had left and that she didn't know where they had actually gone. Uh, her plan was for the spies to leave her house after nightfall. She lowered them down uh, after the city gate had been closed and after the authorities were long gone in search of those two spies. In return, for not divulging their whereabouts, Rahab made the spies promise that when the Israelites entered Jericho, all of her household would be spared. Uh, and she was to, uh, to put a scarlet um, uh, cloth there hanging from her window so that when Israel entered Jericho, they'd know not to bother that household. Rahab was not only a Canaanite, she was not only a Gentile, she was not only a prostitute, Rahab was a conniving prevaricator. Put simply, Rahab was a liar. She lied to the king's men in order to protect God's men. Yet, 
Look how mightily God had planned to use this Gentile prostitute named Rahab. She would indeed be protected when the Israelites entered Jericho, and Rahab would have a place within the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Is that not amazing? This is just additional proof that God didn't choose to use the cream of the crop in a manner of speaking uh, when it came to fleshly performance in his plan to repossess the earthly realm. Uh, God never chose to use men based on their behavior. We've seen that over and over again in our journey through the Bible. Those that God chose to use were chosen on the basis of what God foreknew would be their belief, not their behavior. With all of Rahab's human failures, and sinful behavior, Rahab had come to believe in the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and Joshua. Uh, listen to Rahab tell it in verses 10 and 11 of chapter 2. For we, now notice that pronoun we, this would be the people of Jericho. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you, you people of Israel, when ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites, those two giant kings that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, uh, whom ye utterly destroyed. Verse 11 continues, and like verse 10, it begins with a pronoun we once again. And as soon as we, the people of Jericho, had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you, you Israelite people. Ah, now we come to Rahab's personal mindset in the remainder of the verse. This is her statement. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now we know what Rahab believed. Rahab, the Canaanite, the Gentile, the conniving, lying, prostituted Jericho was professing her belief in the God that the children of Israel were not confessing themselves. Um, their faith, for the most part, was in Joshua. He had led them in, in victory, but we don't see anywhere where they're praising the Most High God for what he was doing on their behalf. Take the man through whom Joshua, uh, for, uh, through whom God had been working out of the picture, take Joshua out of the way, and how much faith do you suppose the children of Israel would have had in the God of their forefather Abraham when it came to those giants? I want to take you back to the words of Moses just before he passed the mantle on to Joshua. Notice his words to Israel at the close of Deuteronomy chapter 33 beginning with verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge, Moses told him. And underneath are the everlasting arms. You see, you've, you've heard this statement before. And he, the eternal God, shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. Israel then shall d dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heaven shall drop down dew. Would Israel do this for God? Well, we're tempted to say yes, but the answer is an emphatic no. Notice verse 27 once again. God would do it for Israel. Israel wouldn't do it for God. As verse 29 goes on to talk about God's capacity on Israel's behalf. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people, saved by the Lord the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency. And thine enemy shall be found liars unto thee. That's going to take place. The Hivite people are going to lie to Israel coming up in Joshua. But he's telling them ahead of time, thine enemy shall be find, found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. What a promise. And what a declaration of God's name to the nation that had yet to gain a full grasp of that name, much less trust in it. Uh, well, God was going to demonstrate the capacity of his name all over again for the nation that had yet come to realize the significance of that name. Just as he had exercised his name on behalf of his nation throughout their wilderness wanderings and in their conquests on the east side of the Jordan, God would put his name into action on behalf of his nation when it came to crossing the Jordan. Just as God had parted the waters of the Red Sea after Israel had been rescued from their Egyptian captivity, God halted the waters of the Jordan so the people, uh, the children of Israel could pass through on dry ground. Here, if you think about it, the second generation of Israelites were enabled to witness what the generation before them had been able to witness at the Red Sea. God parting the waters. And he's, he's doing so in regard to the capacity resident in his name. There isn't any doubt that God was continually demonstrating his name to his faithless nation. How long did it take the children of Israel to cross the Jordan River? Does anyone know? The Bible doesn't provide the answer. However, the people were numbered in the plains of Moab. Uh, and the head count 
of the males, only the males, 20 years old and up, who were able to go to war, was 601,730. The census would have been much higher had all the men under age 20 and those over age 20 who were unable to fight due to age or sickness been added along with the women and the children and then the priesthood were not numbered in that census. Had all then, them been added to the census account, there could well have been over two and a half million Israelites. Not to mention the vast herds belonging to all those tribes. One study provides these figures. Traveling several persons abreast, we could start by assuming that on average one person crossed every second, day and night, for 24 hours a day. Two and a half million people would have taken up to 29 days to cross the River Jordan. Just an interesting little side note there. However long it took Israel there to complete their crossing, the Lord provided miraculous passage by halting the waters of the Jordan River. When we come to chapter 5, Joshua relates how after that crossing, the Israelite men were circumcised while encamped at Gilgal prior to their conquest at Jericho. Now, I've added an illustration entitled From Jordan to Jericho to, to highlight the two events uh, related to Israel's crossing. In Joshua, chapter 6 through 12, we see Canaan subdued. Recall how the giants, the Anakim, were in the land at that time. Uh, but to get back to that other event that we didn't speak too much about, why was the second generation circumcised at Gilgal? Because only the first generation had been circumcised. Now the second generation has to be circumcised at Gilgal. Um, but you recall how the giants, the Anakim, were in the land at that time? To show you that, uh, that God meant what he said, said what he meant, meant what he said when told Joshua would, be, would drive out the inhabitants of the land before them, we'll visit some of Israel's conquests in their acquisition of Canaan. Uh, Judges chapter 6 through 12 are all about Israel's conquests in Canaan. The first victory for Israel in Canaan came where? At Jericho. Uh, this event's perhaps one of the most well-known stories of scripture, especially to young people who've had Sunday school. Uh, do you recall what happened there? Well, Joshua and the warriors of Israel were told to encircle Jericho once a day for six days. Then on the seventh day, they were to encircle the city seven times. The people were told to keep, keep totally silent until Joshua gave the order to shout on that, after that seventh encircling. When that order was given and obeyed, the walls of Jericho would come tumbling down, as the uh, song later on would say. Israel wouldn't have to bring those walls down because God would bring those walls down for Israel. There's no questioning the display of God's name on that day, is there? Uh, let's take a brief look at what happened on the seventh day after the seventh circling of the city and the shout by the people. And it came to pass, Joshua 6, verses 16 and 17, at the seventh time, when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city, and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. <laughs> she and all that are with her in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. How did Israel fare? Well, most of you know that the walls of Jericho did indeed come tumbling down. A better question would be, how did the inhabitants of Jericho fare? Um, save for Rahab and her relatives, of course. The answer sits in verse 21. And they, speaking of the warriors of Israel, utterly destroyed how many? All that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. The Israelite fighters were told that they could take all the gold, all the silver, the vessels of brass and iron from Jericho so that those goods could be placed in the treasury of the house of the Lord. In other words, those goods belonged to the Lord, not to the warriors. However, they were warned not to take what the Bible calls the accursed thing, which if any man took, he was to be burnt, uh, fried to a crisp, <laughs> uh, along with everything that belonged to that man, including his sons, his daughters, his herds, his ten, anything else that man may have owned was to be totally burned. Uh, well, no one knew that a member of the Israelite forces had done the very thing those forces were sternly commanded not to do. They didn't know it uh, until, that is, they were defeated by the king Ai, a king who ruled over very few people. 
and who made Israel's army retreat like a bunch of whipped puppies. Um, you see, at Jericho, all the bounty was to be brought to the house of the Lord. Israel had such success at Jericho, they reasoned they'd have no difficulty at all in conquering Ai, a very small place. But you see, God refused to exercise his name after Jericho on behalf of Israel at Ai. Why? Because a member of the nation hadn't followed God's directions back at Jericho. Anyone know the name of that man? Well, Joshua was grieving Israel's defeat, being bested by such a small group of, pe of fighters at Ai, and he knew that would demoralize the people of his nation when the Lord revealed what a member of Israel's army, a man named Achan, had taken. <laughs> uh, Achan had stolen some, some bounty for himself, and he had hidden his treasure under the dirt floor of his tent. Uh, what belonged to the Lord was not to be taken. A lesson soon to be learned by the man named Achan. We could do some poetry here, could we not? In Joshua chapter 7, Achan made his confession. He was confronted uh, by Joshua, and Achan made his confession, and God's directions in the case of such a transgression were to be carried out on Achan and his family to the full. What's God showing Israel here? I keep my word. If I promised you this is what will happen to a man who does such a transgression, this is exactly what will happen to that man. So God was showing Israel here that he would keep his word. And Achan, along in, with his entire household, his animals, his relatives, everything he owned, including his tent, were to be destroyed by fire. It was only after Israel carried out the punishment that Achan's transgression called for that God would then be again with the nation in their conquest of of Canaan. Israel carried out the punishment after which God told Joshua to confront the, courses, or the forces of King Ai a second time. Try it now. It'll work for you now. Notice the results of that second conflict in Joshua chapter 8 verses 25 and 26. And so it was that all that fell that day, both of men and women, were 12,000, even all the men of Ai. For Joshua drew not his hand back wherewith he stretched out the spear until he had utterly destroyed next word every single one of the inhabitants of Ai not many not most but every single one of the people of the city of course news of that victory their Israel's victory at Ai along with their victory over the two kings on the other side of the Jordan King Sion and Og began to spread like wildfire throughout that area of Canaan uh, and as a consequence, fear began to spread like wildfire through the residents of Canaan. I want you to notice those who were gathering against Israel as we come to Joshua chapter 9. And keep in mind again, Joshua is a bit different than that Joshua is all about conflict. Joshua is all about conquest, the conquest of Israel, of God for Israel, so the land would be prepared, opened up, so that Israel could take their positions, the tribes could take their ownership of Canaan. Verse 1 in Joshua 9 opens with the ominous intention of more than a few opposition kings as Satan began amassing his brigades to fight against Israel. Joshua 9 verses 1 and 2, And it came to pass when all the kings which were on this side of Jordan, in the hills, in the valleys, and all the coasts of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite and the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, all those oppositionites we've been talking about all along, when they heard thereof, what Israel had done, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua uh, and with Israel with one accord. They didn't gather together to join his team and fight alongside him. They joined together to fight against him. So that is all but one group. And that group was from a small place called Gibeon. Who dwelt at Gibeon? Well, those were the Hivites. Uh, we mentioned those. God said he's, that he was going to drive them out. Gibeon was a Canaanite city north of Jerusalem. The Hivites dwelt, as I said, at Gibeon. And they came along, uh, they came up with what they believed to be a clever ploy for self-preservation. They had heard what Israel had done. They donned ragged attire. They wore worn out shoes. They carried with them dried up bread, stale bread, empty canisters of wine. And with that haggard look and that disguise and their used up supplies, they made Joshua believe that they were from a far off land and that all they'd come to do was to serve God's nation. Uh, Joshua, along with the heads of the tribes in Israel, fell for the Hivite ruse. Remember when God said, those you encounter will lie to you? Here it is. 
we're seeing the lie. Verse 14 is the telling verse where Joshua and the leaders of the nation are concerned, folks. What should they have done at this point in time? Stop and think about it now. The lesson is about God's name. Should they have called upon the name of the Lord for further instruction? Or should they have taken it upon themselves to determine their own, uh, determine their own direction? Uh, their response to the Hivite imposters will tell us the degree to which Israel had learned their lesson about who they were not and about their need of who God really is and that they could count on him to lead them. Let's look at their response at this time. Joshua 9.14 After all this conquering they'd done and the men of Israel took of there the Hivites' victuals. In other words, they fell for the ploy concerning their spent provisions. And here it is. The men of Israel asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. Well, they didn't need his advice, did they? Look at all the destruction they'd already brought, all the slaughter of the people that had already taken place with the Lord fighting on their behalf. They don't need him now. Things are going well. Another failure of the nation to call upon God's name. Now, in light of all that we've seen thus far, a demonstration of the failure of man followed right on the heels uh, of that by a presentation of the capacity resident in God's name. Uh, what should we expect to see next if the pattern holds true? We've seen the failure of man. We see it right there. They, they, they did not call upon the name of the Lord. Um, on the heels of man's lack of capacity, as proven by his performance, we should expect to see God demonstrate the capacity of his name all over again through the exercise of his power on behalf of his people. That's been the pattern. Uh, the performance failure of man, the power inherent in God's name, and all in connection with God's plan to repossess the earthly realm. If the pattern holds true, we should now expect to see God exercise his name once again on behalf of his people. As he continues that educational process of the nation, he promised to make of Abram. And that's precisely what we see as the pattern just keeps following. Man's failure, God's name. Man's failure, God's name. Uh, in Joshua chapter 10, Joshua defeated the Amorite armies of five kings. We won't go into the details. Who were coming against the city of Gibeon. In fact, God made the sun stand still for an entire day until Israel had conquered her foes. But Israel hadn't been the power source of that victory, as we well know. You have to love the way verse 14 ends in chapter 10. It ends with these words. For the Lord fought for Israel. Exercising his name all over again. And he didn't stop fighting for Israel on that occasion. Uh, all the way up through chapter 12 of Joshua. And that's what the book of Joshua is primarily about. God fought for his people Israel in the land that he promised to give them. Uh, we won't go into all the details of Israel's battle, but... Uh, uh, just a few in Joshua chapter 10. Joshua took a location called Makeda with the edge of the sword. The verse there in Joshua 10, 28 says, And all the souls that were therein, he let none remain. There's a battle at Libna, another area, in Joshua chapter 10 as well, verse 30. The Lord delivered it also, the king thereof, into the hand of Israel, and he smote it with the edge of the sword. And all the souls that were therein, he let none remain in it. Lachish, another location right on the hills of, of Libna there. Um, same, same story. Uh, Joshua 10.32, the verses follow right on the hills of one or the other. The Lord delivered Lachish into the hand of Israel, which took it on the second day and smote it with the edge of the sword and all the souls that were therein, according to all that he had done unto Libna. So there was a veritable bloodbath going on in the land of Canaan. It, as God was preparing that land, emptying that land out as he was fighting on behalf of his nation. Uh, the city of Gezer is destroyed in verse 33. Uh, the verse says the same thing, until, he had, until Joshua had left none remaining in Gezer. Joshua 10.35, um, another area there, Egon, and all the souls that were therein, he utterly destroyed that day. Um, Joshua 10.37, Hebron, Utterly destroyed all the souls that were therein. Uh, verse 39, Deber, he took it. Left none remaining. Destroyed all the souls that were therein. Uh, we see a summary. Let's just look at the, very quickly at the summary. Here it is, Joshua 10. And we're just going to jump ahead to verse 40. And 42. Here it is the summary. So Joshua smote all the country of the hills, and of the south, and of the vale, and of the springs, and all their kings. He left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed as the Lord God of Israel commanded. And all these kings and their land did Joshua take at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. 
Now, this should take us back to a verse. And I'll just say it very quickly. It's Leviticus chapter 26, verse 8. Do any of you remember that? It's used today in our day when it's actually not for us. It was for the people of another day. And five of you shall chase a hundred. And a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. Now you know what that's talking about. You can relate that right back to the book of Joshua. We'll see it again in the book of Judges where the numbers are actually put, put there. Had Israel learned about God's name? You think they actually came to understand God's name at that time and he would be her banner and her conquering hero? Had they learned, had they learned it sufficiently enough about God's name that they would trust in that name and call upon that name? Well, we'll pick it up here and we'll be entering the book of Judges and we'll see if that was the case. Um, they should not have chosen to have God deal with them by way of their performance under a law contract. And I think that's what we're going to see as we continue on. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. We'll pick it up here in our next study as we uh, will look to the book of Judges.